Would you stay standing for the reading of the scriptures? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for environments like this, for moments like this, for the words that are recorded in the scriptures that remind us of how much you truly love us. And God, I pray if we hear nothing else this morning, that we would all leave here with a sense of the depth of your love for us. And so God, I pray however we're showing up this morning, whatever we're bringing in, God, I pray that your words would bring healing to us. That your presence would be felt among us. We invite you here now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You can have a seat. Uh, Thank you, Ben, so much. Bree, my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Can we thank Bree uh, and the band? Um, Every Sunday, I'm like, that's my favorite worship leader. And then it changes every week. Um, But, man, we're so blessed. Thank you so much. Um, If you're new with us, welcome to Makers Church. I did meet a couple uh, new folks this morning, so I'm just so glad that you're here. Welcome. Um, If we haven't met yet, my name is Derek, and I serve here as our lead pastor. And um, if you're coming back uh, for the first time in a while or weren't here last week or the last couple of weeks, uh, you're all joining us in uh, a series that we began just a few weeks ago called The Good Life. And what we're doing for the next five months is we're going to thoroughly and slowly walk through these words of Jesus that are recorded in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, 6, and 7, often referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we're going to walk slowly through these words and, and uh, try our best to make sense of them. And we don't want to rush through them because we believe that, that these words of Jesus are essentially his manifesto. They're his treatise on what it means for us as his people to live into the kingdom of God, the kingdom that he wants us to be co-heirs of and participants in. And he lays out for us through some very troubling and strange words what it means to be in this kind of kingdom. And what Jesus invites us to is to kind of take inventory of and to challenge the status quo, to adopt a radically different kind of way of thinking and being and showing up in the world, that we would live into a kingdom that is different than the kingdom of the world. And these are the radical and troubling words of Jesus that we are beginning to unpack. Last week, we started with the Beatitudes, the opening of the Sermon on the Mount. We got through the first four uh, of those uh, sayings of Jesus where he calls a very strange kind of people blessed. In those first few uh, sayings of Jesus, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And, And we did our best to kind of unpack that and understand that last week because that seems like a category of people who have everything other than the good life. And today we're going to be kind of on this tipping point, this this hinge point into the last of the Beatitudes, the the next four sayings before the, the sermon opens up into its entirety. And um, I I ended the sermon last week with some words from my friend Jason Adam Miller, who wrote this book called When the World Breaks. And um, I cannot recommend this book more highly if you were troubled by and trying to make sense of these blessings that Jesus calls the Beatitudes. And uh, this book has been so, so instrumental in helping me frame and make sense of these sayings, and I'm going to use it quite a bit today 
uh, to help us make sense of these next four sayings. Uh, over history, as people have wrestled with these words, uh, most theologians and scholars have realized that there's a radical shift between the first four blessings and the second four blessings. Now, the first half of the Beatitudes, like we talked about last week, really talk about what happens to us when we suffer and deal with all of the broken things around us. And the second four actually seem to make a turn, and Jesus turns his attention to the kind of people who put the world back together, or at least help, to the merciful, to the pure in heart, to the peacemakers, and in some strange way, we'll get to it towards the end, the persecuted. And once you notice this shift, once you make sense of, oh, that, it, it, there's these first four kinds of people he's talking about. They seem connected in some kind of way, at least through their pain and through their suffering. But then these next four categories of people, they seem to be like a different kind of people, like a different uh, breed of persons. And it almost makes you wonder, like, did Jesus get a different audience somehow in the shift from the first floor to the second floor? It's almost like he was talking to this half of the room. Like when you walk in to church in the morning, and you're like, those of you with pain and suffering sit on this side. And for those of you who have it together and doing something about the brokenness in the world, sit on this side. And it's like he turns his attention from you all to you all. It's like the room is divided in the middle. But it begins to mess with us because clearly it's not these people, those who are poor in spirit and those who mourn and those who meek, that would also be the same people who give mercy and the same people who, um, who are pure in heart or are the ones that are going to really help make peace in the world. Those seem like kind of diametrically opposed kinds of people, at least if you think like I think. Because if you've ever been in this side of the room, if you've ever been the poor, the downtrodden, the brokenhearted, the poor in spirit, the one who's, who's in a, a season of your life where you have been mistreated or you've been taken advantage of or you aren't getting what you think you should get, if you've been uh, wronged in any kind of way, if you're like me, my tendency is to try to get back or get even. Wow. We, we have this built inside of us. And what Jesus is trying to help us understand through all of this is that this is the same group of people that he's talking to. Jason in his book says this. He says, when we suffer, if we're not careful, we may end up reacting with the same energy that we're trying to resist. Reactions reenact whatever they're responding to. And what happens is it creates this endless cycle of pain and of hurt and of chaos. And this is where violence begets violence. It's where the abused often become the abusers. It's where pain and suffering keeps circulating in our midst, and we are the propagators of it. And what Jesus is trying to get us to see through the first four Beatitudes is that our suffering is not the only thing we have. He's desperately trying to give us the kingdom of God. He's desperately trying to bring comfort to us, to, to help us become inheritors of the earth and to fill us up. And, and perhaps the way that we access those things in our suffering is exactly right there, in our suffering. Not through avoiding it, not by trying to uh, push our way from having to experience it, but through facing it, through going deep into the innermost parts of our being, not trying to find our way around it, but to understand that we must find our way to it. And we meet God there in the middle of it to find our way through it. When we attempt to avoid our, our turmoil and our pain and we resist it or we try to numb it or, or, or we try to walk away from it, it, essentially what Jesus is saying in these first four blessings is that we're abdicating our, ourselves from the promises that he's trying to give us. He says, in our poor in spirit, when we're mourning, when we hunger and thirst, these are the places God wants to meet us. And in Jason's book, he, he, he says it like this. He says, uh, it, it's not that God is withholding his gifts from us. 
that he's withholding the kingdom or that he's withholding uh, to hit, hit, hit the earth from us, that, that he's, he's trying to make us suffer for it. No, no, no. It's not that God's withholding these gifts. He desperately wants to give us these things. But he won't do so in a way that oversteps our will. We have to consent. Not, not to the things happening around us or the things that have happened to us. Because much of what we face should be resisted. It should be critiqued. It should be called out. But we have to consent to the experience within ourselves. Because it's there, whether we like it or not. It's in the truth of our inner experience. Not a denial of it that God meets us there. It can be really, really hard to find God in the world around us when we haven't found him in the world within us. And when we do, when we become those who can find God in the midst of all of that pain and of all of that brokenness, then we become transformed and we're able to see God in ways that we may maybe have never seen him before. And it's that transformation of the soul that Jesus is trying to get us to understand and receive through these words. Father Richard Rohr says that if we do not transform our pain, we most assuredly will transmit it. And I, I would go further to say that we actually have no power to transform our pain, but we can meet God and allow him to transform it. So that we no longer become those who transmit it in the world over and over again. And then we see the Apostle Paul begin to make sense of these words of Jesus as he's teaching the church how to deal with some of these really hard things. In Romans chapter 5 verse 2 he says, We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who, he, who has been given to us. And so it's through this suffering, it's through us not avoiding it or skirting around it, but going deep into it where we can meet God and allow him to bring the healing and transformation that only he can bring. And we become the kind of people who become reconciled to ourselves and to God, and then we can then become those who help bring reconciliation into the world around us. So let's take a closer look at these next four sayings, these next four blessings that Jesus gives as he speaks to those who might participate with him in bringing this kind of healing, this kind of wholeness, this kind of transformation into the world. He says, blessed are the merciful, for as they shall be shown mercy. And we see that Jesus begins to shift. He's, he's moving his conversation from what seems to be a disempowered group of people to a group of people who at least have some sense of power. Because if there's something that we have to give, then it must mean that we must have something. And if we are those who can give mercy, then that pushes us into the position of power in some sense. Merciful can mean uh, to be generous with our things or our money. It could mean to forgive. But I think particularly the best way it helps me understand to, to be merciful is to refrain from the use of our power in a way that we can easily lord it over someone. Yeah. To refrain from and restrain our power. To, to describe ourselves as those who might be the ones who should be seeking revenge, who should be trying to get back or get even, but instead we refrain from doing so. Uh, I love this old uh, juxtaposition here. Sometimes we, we, we confuse or conflate justice and, uh, sorry, we conflate mercy and grace. We kind of use them as synonyms for one another, but they're actually different words. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Or if we're the ones who are giving it, it's not dishing out what somebody else deserves. Grace is getting what we don't deserve or what we haven't earned. 
or it's giving away something that nobody did anything for. And I, I think this really helps me understand the depths of what mercy is. Because if you just look around, there's all sorts of righteousness that we try to grab a hold of when we have been wronged. In fact, Jason says it like this in his book. He titled his chapter on this. He says, we're never more certain of our own righteousness than when we know that we've been wronged. When you've been wronged, when we have been wronged, that is the moment where we feel the most self-righteous. Like we have something that we can lord over someone and we're all really good at dishing it out. At seeking revenge. At making someone pay the punishment for the, 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 the thing they did against us. And Jesus blesses those who refrain from doing so. He blesses the merciful. We see this in our kids all the time. If you have kids, uh, you know this. If not, you can just watch mine. Um, you know, they, they, they want to continue the cycle of violence, right? One kid hits one kid, and the other one whacks him right back without even thinking about it. And you, you walk up into the room or wherever they're at, and you're like, what happened? And they're like, she hit me. And then the other one's like, well, she hit me first. And then the other one's like, well, she said something. And the other one's like, yeah, but she looked at me funny. And the other one's like, but she just exists. <laughs> Hence my, my, my right place in the world to hit back. In this cycle, it will just go on and on and on. And something needs to disrupt that cycle. Yeah. And what Jesus is saying is mercy is what throws a wrench into the system. It, it literally throws a, a stick in the spokes of the bike. It just stops the cycle in its tracks. And if you've ever extended mercy before, if you've ever been the one who like forgave and it was a really hard thing to do. You gave mercy and, and you knew you shouldn't have or didn't need to, but you did. Oh, that feels pretty good. Have you ever done the right thing? Well, that could lead to feeling righteous. And if we stew on that for too long, then we can become self-righteous start feeling pretty good about ourselves because of how merciful and benevolent we are as human beings and how much like Jesus we are. We're doing it. We're getting it right. And so Jesus, in his next turn of phrase, he, he speaks to our pride. He says, bless are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Wait a minute. I don't need mercy. I'm the one given mercy. I, I don't, I, I'm the one getting this right. Didn't you see what I did? Didn't you understand that I broke the cycle? I, I, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And Jesus just hits us with the one-two punch. And he's like, no, no, no. Yeah, you're in desperate need of mercy. Even if it's just for the way you're feeling about yourself for the mercy you gave. Like we need to give and receive mercy. And what I, I love to understand about these sayings of Jesus, these beatitudes, they're not, they're not just an if this, then that kind of saying. They're not like a if you give mercy, you will receive mercy. They also work the other way around. If that, then this. Oh, I, I get it. Because I've received mercy. I can now give it. Yeah. We see this happening all throughout the scriptures, all throughout Jesus' sayings and, and through the teaching in the New Testament. We see even in Jesus' own prayer, he helps us understand the dichotomy, the, the, the paradox between the if this, then that, and the if that, then this reality of the way of Jesus. In his own prayer to God the Father, Matthew 6, in which we'll go deeper to later on in this series, Jesus says, uh, would you pray this way? Forgive us our debts. As we also forgive our debtors. Later on, he says, and if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. And there's not an order to these things that work all the time in the same order. Yeah. But the kingdom is a place where the order of those things shape the way we respond in each and every one of those circumstances. 
Pray for those who forgive you their trespasses, and your heavenly Father will also forgive you. We're seeing Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. There is a, a permeable and symbiotic relationship between our giving and our receiving. Not just of this blessing, but of all of the ways of Jesus. We aren't to get what we can, can what we get, and sit on the can. We don't just receive it, hold on to it, cling to it, keep it for ourselves. We are conduits. It's, it's what this word is used oftentimes. We are conduits of the grace and mercy and goodness of God. We are not containers. We're conduits, not containers. And then he goes on to say, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. You know, one of the things I love about the Beatitudes is they almost serve as like a table of contents to the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. They're like these little zingers, these little one-liners that are really confusing uh, at first. And if you chew on them for a while and pray through them and, and study them and let them work on you, um, they, they might make some, some meaning and some sense. But if you continue reading the Sermon on the Mount, you realize that, that all of these sayings of Jesus are tethered to a deeper and a more robust teaching. Like for an example, this one where it says that blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God, he's, he's helping us understand that there's this highway between our eyes and our souls. Between our eyes and our hearts. And later on, Jesus gives a teaching uh, that our eyes are a window to the body. And we'll have fun with that in a few weeks. We'll, we'll make some sense of that. Um, but these, these, these kind of open up and Jesus goes deeper and he helps us make sense of what it means to have a connection between the things we see, the things we take in, the things that we consume, and how they shape how either pure or impure the depth of our being is. There's a connection between the condition of our inner world and the way we see and interpret the world around us. And it's so true oftentimes that we don't always see things the way they are. We see them through the filter of who we are or what our experience has been or what our, our, our lived experience is. And so Jason, in, in, in his book, he, he asked this question that, that I think is worthy of repeating. So what does it mean then to be pure in heart? And a lot of times we come to these assumptions that it must mean to be like spiffy on the inside, to be perfect. A lot of times we talk about like sexual purity or to be the kind of people who don't mess up anymore. And, and there's all sorts of just, quite, what does it mean to be pure in heart? It's a great question. But Jason says this, he says, what if the pure heartedness that Jesus has in mind isn't the purity of an unscathed soul? What if he's not talking about pretending not to be human or to have desires? What if he's not blessing people who live up to some moral or sexual standard? What if purity of the heart describes an inner life where the kingdom of heaven has found a home through the permeable boundaries of an impoverished spirit? And what if he's talking about an inner world where the dark shadows of grief have been illuminated by a fresh vision of glory? What if he's talking about the kind of person whose desperate grasping has transformed into a trusting receiving? I don't know if those questions help you. If you're like me, you can be frustrated that you answer a question with the question, what does it mean to be pure in heart? But I think these questions... They do something in us. They help us make sense of what it might look like for us to see God. And I also think that this if, this, then, that juxtaposition also plays into this reality. If that, then this. If we can see God in the world... And we can see God in our neighbors and especially in our enemies. 
If we can see God at work in the places and all of the nooks and crannies in the world, in areas where it seems like he should be distant from, but we see him active in, if we can see God there, then it may lead to us having a pureness in our heart because we see the goodness of God in all of those unlikely places. And then he says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. If, if you've been consistently at Maker's Church now for a while, you're like, oh no, here we go, the peacemaking talk. Because we, we talk about peacemaking a lot here at Maker's. It's, it's central to who we are as a church community. And, and uh, if you want to go deeper, I'm going to scratch the surface. I mean, we have a whole series. We've got messages. and Even the political series we just did, we talked a lot about peacemaking. But I think when we wrestle with this one, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. There's a couple things that, that, that jump out to me about this. And just a reminder, uh, when Jesus is talking about making peace, it's very different than keeping the peace, right? And, and this is a, a sentiment that's been kind of made its way um, in, in, in our understanding as people, right? As we're going, man, the world is so divided. The world is polarized. The world is, is chaotic. And um, peacekeeping can often be the very thing that keeps us in these cycles that we're in, right? To just maintain the status quo, to not disrupt anything, to not shake the boat, to not ruin anything, uh, just kind of keep quiet. And I want to say also in the same sentiment that uh, disrupting the status quo isn't always peacemaking either, because some of us just have like a vengeful spirit. The last one didn't make its work on us, the mercy thing. And so we have something out to get or prove or, or, or say something about. And so we just go mess everything up and stir the pot. And, and that also doesn't necessarily lead to peace making. But to be clear, what, what Jesus is talking about and what the scriptures say, Jesus himself is the prince of peace. This is, this is what he came to do in the world to bring peace, to bring uh, deep harmony and proper relationship between each other and between us and God. This is, this is the work of Jesus. This is what he does. This is what he did on the cross through his life, his death, and his resurrection. He's bringing peace to the world. But one of the biggest things that stands in the way of us being a peaceful kind of people as part of our wiring, is we, we, and we've talked a lot about this here, is we just are so gravitationally pulled into groupthink, to group identity, into, into places where we find people like us, that think like us, that, that act like us, that dress like us, and wear Eagles jerseys, and we do it in all sorts of, of ways, right? We find the people we're fans with, we love the Padres, we hate the Dodgers, but then you're faced with, oh no, what if it's the Dodgers and the Yankees and I hate both of those teams and what am I going to do and I got to pick a side and I got to root for someone and we'll find ourselves into all of these polarized places, not to mention the elections in a couple weeks and there's nothing going on with that. In Jason's book, he helps us understand this a little more. He says, identity activates under threat. When we feel threatened, we go find a people to feel safe with. And if you think about the way of polarizing political rhetoric works, it's always fear-based. Yeah. Polarizing leaders tell their people that other people, other groups, are a threat to them and that the leader will protect them from those bad people. And we can try to step back and, and, and see how this problematic, how problematic this is, but we're all susceptible to it, right? We want to point the finger at it and say, how dare you? But man, we do it in all sorts of ways every day. And the research is pretty clear that these tendencies are wired deep into our essence. The level of our consciousness, the, the reptilian mind, even the fight or flight mechanism in us is wired for safety. And we will go find group identities to be a part of. And this is often the cause of all of the chaos and tension and lack of peace in the world. In fact, we see Jesus kind of stepping into this head on at the very beginning of his ministry. If you know the story where Jesus is tempted in the wilderness and he goes out and he faces the devil himself. He comes back. He, yes, he goes back after that time. He comes to the uh, city of Nazareth, his hometown. 
And he goes into the synagogue and he reads this passage from Isaiah. It says this in Luke 4. He reads this. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And the people hear this and they are ecstatic. They are thrilled. They're like, he's the one. He's the Messiah. He's the hero. He's the one that's going to come and do this for us. And then just six verses later, just six verses later, we read this. They're pissed. They're furious. All the people in the synagogues were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off a cliff. Did you ever realize that Jesus, before he died on the cross, almost died from being thrown off of a cliff? But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. I love that just little last sentence. But he just walked through unscathed because it wasn't his time. What happened in the six verses between he's the one who's going to come and save us and let's go throw him off of a cliff? He continues to quote the prophets. He continues to tell a story that they have told for, for years and years before. He says, and there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed. Only Naaman the Syrian. Who's Naaman the Syrian? He's the commander of the Syrian army. He's in that other group. He's not one of us. When they heard Jesus say, quoting the prophet Isaiah, that he's going to proclaim the good news to the poor and give sight to the blind and set the oppressed free, they only can see themselves as the oppressed ones. They only can see themselves as the ones who have been wronged or harmed and the only one who Jesus is there to bring liberty and freedom to. They want it for themselves, not for them, not for the other ones. And they're so pissed about it, they try to kill him. They're so upset about it that he is, they're trying to end him. And so in this inaugural story, before Jesus sets out into his ministry, The story that sets the entire theme for what he's doing in the world. He tells his people that God is doing the things God promised to do. But the activity of God is going to take place beyond the boundaries you've drawn. Between your group and everyone else. And they absolutely can't handle it. And so this is a warning for all of us. Especially if we love the idea of peacemaking. This is a warning for us. Because there's a problem that begins to happen when we can step out of our home team. There's something that shifts when we can start seeing God at work in those other places and spaces that we don't want to be a part of. We actually don't like those people or that thing. And when we can see God start I mean, we can start to see God working in those spaces. It's a dangerous place for us. When we walk to the, the edge of the boundary of our own group, and then we step out of it towards another group, we are in a hostile place. Because the group we're walking towards will see us as their enemy. And the group we just left will see us as traitors. It's a dangerous place. I just started studying for a promotional exam at work. Sorry, Nate. We were trying to do this thing together. Uh, We decided we weren't going to do it together. And then I had a change of heart about two weeks ago and started studying to be a battalion chief. And I'm not excited about the process or studying or any of that. Um, And as I was preparing the sermon, it dawned on me that this is exactly why. The battalion chief is this weird intermediary between labor and management. And you literally don't belong to either group. You're just out in that middle space 
between the people who were your people and the people who want you to be their people, but you aren't quite yet because they don't quite trust you because you're still connected to these people, but these people don't quite trust you because you're connected to these people. Why would I sign up for that? And the reality is, is that peacemaking is lonely. Don't get me wrong. Don't skew the metaphor. I'm not saying every battalion chief's a peacemaker. But when people shun you and every other group still doesn't trust you, and you're going to try to maintain this peacemaking posture in the world, it's really, really tempting to feel the gravitational pull into that next group. Oh, they might receive me. We're looking for identity. We're looking to be welcomed and belong and love. And we have to resist that as peacemakers because that also comes with strings to then turn around and hate the group you just came from. And there's a kind of belonging that we can search for and easily find that will root us in a propensity to other and demonize and look poorly upon the people that aren't in that group, whatever it might be. I know this is really messing with some of your MLB and NFL stuff. But I think that Jesus in this blessing, he knew full well what it would like to stand in this place. And the very thing that gave him the courage to do that is when Jesus was being baptized and he came up out of the water, the Lord opened up the skies and said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And this is before Jesus had done anything. He had done nothing yet. His public ministry hadn't started and he knew who he was in his relationship to God the Father. He knew he was his son. And so Jesus gives us this blessing. As beautiful and heartwarming as it sounds to be children of God, maybe the reason that Jesus promises us this, if we choose to become peacemakers, is that he knows no one else will claim us. There's no other group that you're going to root your identity in or need to root your identity in if we're willing to understand our place as a child of God. Is there any other belonging that we need? Is there any other group identity that we should strive for? And so he says, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. And then he goes to the last part of this whole conundrum. All of that, by the way, is going to cause you to be persecuted. And I'm out of time, so I'm going to make this quick. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Hold on to that part. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. So I just want you to understand, those things aren't true without those qualifiers. Blessed are the persecuted. You're not blessed unless it's because of your righteousness. The kingdom of heaven you're not blessed when people insult you or persecute you and falsely say all kinds of things. That's an awful thing. You shouldn't hope for that. But when they do so because of your relationship with him, because of your belovedness, because of your understanding that you are a child of God, then rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so we can easily feel in the culture wars that we're in and all of the group identity that we find ourselves in that we are the victim, that we are being persecuted. Jesus isn't talking about discomfort. He's not talking about the, the circle that you find yourself in getting, you know, 
uh, challenged. It's, it, it's not about that. It's about us finding our true identity in Christ and because of it, standing in a place in the world that is outside of all these other demands around us. And I want to end with uh, uh, some excerpts out of Jason's book here because I think he says it in a way that I, I don't know how to. And I think it's so beautiful as we round out and make sense of all of this. When Jesus describes persecution, these are Jason's words, it's not a theoretical experience. In his own life and death, you can see evil unloading its entire arsenal against him. Evil brings everything that it has to the fight, and for three days, it looks like evil has the final word. It looks like violence has overcome his life. It looks like all the promises were naive. It seems like the bedrock picture of reality that he describes as the kingdom of heaven has only been a mirage because its rewards were nowhere to be found when he hung on a cross and lay dead in a tomb. But that's not the end of the story. And this is where the surprise comes in this last blessing. If evil is an unlimited asset, an endless energy with its own infinite life and resources, well then, evil can come after everyone and everything all the time. And persecution wouldn't really mean much because it would be indiscriminate. And I love this so much. But evil is a limited resource. Why do I say that? Well, it comes from my reading of the crucifixion of Jesus. Evil exhausted its arsenal against him. And then when evil had brought everything it had, when evil had mounted its greatest challenge to the, to the love of God and put him in the grave, love still had more to say. And resurrection is a story about the life of God and the love of God being inexhaustible, unlimited while evil runs its course. And resurrection is a story about the kingdom of heaven enduring. And this is why I believe evil is a limited resource. If, like evil, you are in a fight with limited resources, you don't expend those resources indiscriminately. Use them tactically and surgically with only so much ammo. You don't just pull the trigger and spray the field. You wait for the moment. You go after the high-value target. And Jesus' last blessing is for the people who found that they have become that target. That's what it means to be persecuted. Do you see what that means? Jesus began these blessings by speaking to us in ways that feel like our deepest powerlessness. He blesses us in our sadness and in our suffering. He spoke to us in broken down conditions that emerge when the world breaks and when it breaks us. But by the end, just a few blessings later, he's speaking to us with the assumption that we're going to need a blessing for the days when evil decides that we are the people who must be taken out. The sad sufferers have become the truly powerful ones. Not because we fought fire with fire, not because we reacted violently, no. With the help of these surprising promises, we found our own tendencies to transmit our pain into the world being subverted. Do you see what he's doing through these blessings? You see what he's trying to help us make sense of in our own identity of who we are because of him. <laughs> you know, there's a, a lot of preaching that will remind us or tell us or try to convince us that Jesus died so that we don't have to. But what Jason helps us see in the book, he says it like this, but the reality is that Jesus didn't die so that we don't have to. He died to show us how to. He died to show us how to come to the end of ourselves so that we can find the fullness of life that Jesus is trying to offer us. 
and to believe that there will be more to the story. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for all of the ways that you pursue us. All of the ways that you try to help us make sense of who you are and of who we are. And God, this upside down kingdom that you've invited us into is an impossible place to end up without your power. We can't be these kind of people. We can't give mercy if we've never received it. We can't be peacemakers, God, if we haven't found peace with you. We can't endure persecution unless we understand that evil is a limited resource. And that Jesus, you are showing us how to come to the end of ourselves so that we can awaken to, come alive into the fullness of the life that you have for us. God, you promise life abundant, life everlasting. It starts the moment we say yes to the gifts you want to give us. God, we are the recipients both of mercy and of your grace. And so, God, we pray that you would bring us to the place where we receive it with open hearts and open lives. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Would you stand and sing one last song with us? And I want to invite you, if you want prayer in the back, our prayer team is going to be available in the prayer corner, and we would love to pray with you or for you. And um, thanks for being with us this morning.